Hello, my name is Matt. Welcome to Unbearable 73. In this episode, we'll be talking about From Season 2, Episode 5, entitled Lullaby. And I'm seeking my, always seeking my inevitable Pepsi sponsorship, if you happen to be watching Pepsi Company. My throat is shot. It is just shot for the past two days. Um, I have to get it going. So the production continues to be high quality. No, no changes there. So let's get right into the story. So we open up with the pri- with the pre credit scenes. Uh, first, we start with Randall and his new bus residence at night. He hears knocking and his volatile rage. He almost opens the door. Clearly, Randall, we've learned for five episodes, he has control problems that's, uh, or problems with control issues, and that sets his rage off every single time. You know, ranting at, like, demonic monsters that will kill you, that why they're leaving you alone, you'll see when you get there. He's, it's... A persistent part of his character. Then the show uh, hits the next subplot with Jade having a, some sort of daymare involving his notebook and uh, and so forth, with where he's drawing all that symbol over and over again and variations of it. And then we get a haunting rendition by the Pixies of Kesara Sara as the theme song rolls in. This is this is one of the few examples of a TV theme show that I will listen to every single time it plays. This is one of the top. And covers of all time. So right after the credits, we get Boyd in the church with Sarah as the Matthews family comes up to the church, and they're enraged because Sarah tried to kill their son. And that's how she wound up killing her brother, who was protecting her son, the, protecting the Matthews son. So after some roundabout, we get a very good sequence here in dialogue where Boyd reminds Jim and Tabitha. That making the radio tower, which was uh, Jim and, um, which was Jim and Jade's project, right? The JJ, the, the JJ boys, uh, that has made the situation in town very volatile, because Jim promised this will get them out, and obviously they're not, they just got worse since then, you know. And Boy had worked for, for what seemed to be a year or two. I don't remember exact. I, I don't know if they said the exact amount of time between Boyd becoming sheriff and whatnot, and then I think it's a one to two years where um, Boyd had gotten attacked to a very stable point of view where people were surviving and living through these creatures and not being constantly killed off. Right, so so the town's population had been slowly growing and they've been farming more and gathering resources and whatever. And now that's all gone. Okay. Now. Next, we get a happy, a, a happy if bittersweet moment, where Christy and Marielle are continuing their reunion. You know, we get uh, one great character moment from Ethan Matthews, which I will uh, won't say what it is specifically, but it's uh, he's obviously a child actor, so you you got to use him properly so he doesn't become he doesn't de- detract from the show because. Children have limited acting ranges for the most part. All those kids pretty good so far, you know. But it's a great mo- it's a great moment that's set up very well. And the last story element that I will hint at without spoiling <coughs> is that we learn quite a bit more about Victor and some of the town's history. So I won't spoil that because I think that's good to learn in context. Right now, I'm going to talk a little more spoiler about some a couple particular things that interest me. So as we get towards the end of the episode. Tabitha, has, who's been having visions of her own, she goes to the cave exit where she and Victor escape from the underground and, and sets up like a stone obelisk that she had seen in the underground, right? And then she calls out to the children she had been seeing and a group of ghastly-looking children who are all like, like extremely pale emerge from the woods and begin approaching her and repeating a word or phrase that, that, that we, to our ear, if you turn the subtitles on, it sounds like they're saying something that's, that would be spelled phonetically, a N G H K O E Y Angui Angui Now there's a lot of online speculation as to what they were they were saying. You know. Um I've seen several, so I'll just give you the two that seem most interesting to me. Uh there's a Latin f- phrase, H A N C H U I, Hankui, which translates something like praise her or admire her. And there's a Maori word, Hakui which means something like elderly mother. But there are other besides that interpretations of what, what she's saying. Right? 
you know, some have, some have the red room approach where she's saying like something else backwards or whatever. Um, interesting speculation out there. I, however, I, the important thing to remember from this is that from everything we can tell, the showrunners are making this show's mythology up from scratch, meaning they're not drawing directly from any particular folklore <coughs> or myth, but rather that something they've created with loose, you know, something they create on their own, where they're just pulling bits and pieces from various places. Now, the final important thing to note is that while Tabitha panics when these children start touching her, the children themselves start touching her in a gentle manner. They seem to want something from her. They're not trying to harm her. They're trying to get her to do something for them. Now, another note, uh, I, I won't go into great detail here because uh, I've seen several episodes ahead where it's going, but Jim starts down a very paranoid road, and it's worth watching. Uh, and uh, let me get more of, that, look, more of that looking for the Pepsi sponsorship. And then finally, near the episode, uh, several subplots can start or advance in some short clips. One of which will give will give you an understanding of why I, sus- I began to suspect Tilly, who's one, who's an old woman who came on the bus, more and more. So I'll, I'll mention that a bit below. Now, one, just some general thoughts about the episode. One of the strong suits for this episode, and it's is to jump into the series, but it's really good. This episode is that the show managed to show the humanity of every single character. Okay, they don't uh, they don't shortchange a character just because they're going to be a villain or killed off. They give you character moment, an idea of what's going on, and and the actors do very well with uh, the roles that they're given. Uh, and another great thing this episode emphasizes is the working partnership between Donna and Boyd having keeping everyone alive and sane. Donna comes across as like a curmudgeonly mayor, town mayor, to Boyd's pillar of the community lawman, but Boyd's now going through a crisis of confidence, so Donna's trying to get him back on track. You know. Now, I mentioned Tilly before. I, I've grown very suspicious about her, and I'm going to uh, put a picture of her on the screen. Give me a moment. I should have this prepped by it, obviously, because I'm incompetent. Nope, wrong image. So the woman on the right is Tilly. In the middle is uh, Marielle, and on the left is Christy, right? And Tilly just happens to walk in this scene, and we find out that Tilly might have a terminal disease. She's carrying on a bottle of morphine for the pain or whatever. So she hands that to Christy, who's like the town doc, right? And it just happens to be the time when Marielle can see and hear exactly what she's handing to her, okay? Uh, as it turns out, Marielle is a recovering drug addict, right? But that's not the only thing. She also says something, which I'm not going to spoil, that says it, it's like it's too perfect a coincidence. Now, this, this isn't the only time. Pay attention to this woman. Like, if you want to go back and watch previous scenes or forward and watch others coming as you watch, um, she just seems to show up at particularly optimum, optimum circumstances, does some small little thing which kicks off bigger plot elements all the time, right? And they use her so well that either they're trying to make you suspect her as a, as a misdirect or they're planting hints that she's something more than she says she is. So. Now, one final little thought. I get the impression that these people would communicate more. It might help them, you know, with some of the stuff that's going on. Um, I'd rate this a 9 out of 10. Almost every episode of From is a 9 out of 10 or better. Uh, it's just such an amazing show that more people should be watching. So thanks for watching my video. Smash the like button if you liked it. Uh, hit the dislike if you didn't. Comment down below if you have any questions for me about this video. Please share if you found it worthwhile. I'm Matt. This has been another episode of Unbearable 73. Have a nice day, and I am out of here.